Almighty Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, our glorious and victorious Savior, Jesus Christ, we humbly ask for your blessing upon our worship of you on this, your holy and sanctified Sabbath day, so that we may grow more in our knowledge of you, our love for you, and our obedience to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek, I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnessed of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not the testimony from man, but these things I say, that ye might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape, and ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent, ye believe him not. Search the scripture, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, and ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him will ye receive. How can ye believe which receive honor of one another, and seek not the honor of that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Amen. And those last two verses there are absolutely hair-raising in the reality if you understand who the Lord God was. He was telling them exactly who the Lord God was, which was him, as he was later born as Jesus of Nazareth. That is plainly stated in the Scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament. It's all about Christ. It always has been. The very words that were given to Moses were not Moses. You know, and he wasn't sort of out there doodling in the desert, writing things down, philosophizing, as so many religious people have done, so-called religious people. He was given the word of God by the word of God, as we read in the first chapter of John. The word was with God. The word was God. And he was born flesh among us. Over and over and over and over and over again, it's stated. And the paradox, the amazingness of it is that those who reject it they are in greater numbers Christian professing than merely the people of Judah. It's, it's like the opposite side of a rebel coin. Both have different, there's a different face on each side, but it's a rebel coin. It's a counterfeit rebel coin. And people one day are going to realize that and be absolutely amazed. Suddenly, you know, on that day, on the resurrection day, what divides Judaism and the Church of Rome and, and the Protestant churches of Rome and all the other religions is going to go poof. It's going to be gone. Because there won't be any place at all in the world or in their minds 
for the delusions that they've created for themselves because it will all have been gone. Even their very bodies will be gone, the physical body. All the churches will be gone, so-called churches, the corporations that they've created, the buildings that they've created, the monuments to men that they've created, and women. All gone, and there will only be the Lord. And they're going to realize, you know, when he said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, you shall have no other gods before me. It was talking about the Lord God who was sent by the Father to complete that work, as the plain, plainly stated by the Lord himself. You know, he had works, because it means obedience to the Father. And it's amazing how it's so plainly stated if you have a heart to just take it into your heart. It takes the Holy Spirit, but you know, there were people throughout the scriptures who took the truth to their hearts before their time. A number of examples of it. And so they did, and the Holy Spirit was given to them, even though they wouldn't have been called. And again, which is a testimony in itself, there is no favoritism, good, bad, or otherwise, before or after. It's just a matter of the Lord's sovereign will, God's sovereign will, the Father's sovereign will, because the Lord, as he said, is doing what the Father sent him to do, of choosing people to serve him at whatever time, to call them in order for him to have those servants available when the greater calling happens. That's the reason the truth is so rare in this world right now. But everything is under control. It's everything, it's unstoppable. In this world such as it is, it's just like a, a bubble. It's, it's going to blow. It's just inflating itself up, up, up and up and up more and more and more. But inside is just a whole lot of pressure, a whole lot of nothing. It's, it's the very pressure of itself that makes it so inflated that's going to cause it to blow. And again, that's that's you know what you sow, you shall reap. Same thing. If you you sow a lot of hot air and arrogance, well, it's, it's going to blow. It's going to happen. But again, the goodness of it is not necessarily a destruction. But you know, the truth is so plain, so easy. If you just have a good heart to begin with, it doesn't even take even take a great measure of the Holy Spirit. Because we all have a little bit. But thank God for that as well. If the Lord were to withdraw His breath, His spirit, that Ruach, from which humanity was created from the, the minerals and the organic matter of the soil, everything would drop dead. All living creatures, all breath. Because that breath is dependent, that Holy Spirit is dependent, and that includes animals. Like many people have wondered about, will animals be uh, resurrected? You know, well, we know they're going to be animals in the kingdom of God, and they have to come from somewhere. Uh, it doesn't state it not just emphatically, or categorically, or definitively, but you know, they have to come from somewhere. And again, the references to who knows the spirit of the and it's translated either as breath or spirit. The spirit of the animal goes down with a human spirit goes up, or a lot of people refer that to mean humans go to heaven, but they don't. When they die, they're going to be resurrected on this earth. It seems animals have returned to the earth in the same way. So it's, without getting going on that, I'll put the link on for that study, amazing facts about animals. But There is a world coming, the kingdom of God coming, to this earth, the reason it's created. It's a paradox, you know, if there were no God, well, the scientists uh, wonder, they're finding more and more planets out there. No sign of life, no sign of anything that advanced civilizations that we should have heard from them by now, by, by radio signals, so on. You know, all the signals that, that humans have created right from the earliest time of radio, those were also went out into space. If there's a civilization out there, within a hundred light years, they'd be listening to the first of it. Because that's the speed of radio transmission as well. It travels at the speed of light. They would be hearing it. But if they're more advanced, we should be hearing them as well. There's nothing. There's just silence. And the paradox is, you know, if there were no God, the universe would probably be teeming with alien life. Because it wouldn't have needed a creator to create them. It would have just sort of happened, as the evolutionists and, and atheists believe as it happened under. But it doesn't say that. The Lord created life on this earth as the beginning, the place that will actually become the throne, the headquarters, if you will, of God's throne when God comes to earth. His throne will be here, and then his children, you know, the creation awaits with the children of God. You know, there's a very plain statement there of when there will be life out there, but that life will be the children of God. And it won't mean, mean spaceships and 
and all sorts of things that take years and years and years to get places. It would be instantaneous because even light in itself is a, is a physical entity and spirit can travel a whole lot better and faster than light. So it's it's a question, you know, it's just an amazing thing, the paradoxes of science. I think. But the news, the good news, the gospel, is that everything that was created was created for a purpose. That includes you. But the thing is, you have to accept the offer. That's the reason of your freedoms, the reason the world is in such a state that it is, although most haven't been told yet. It's the reason their case, but even in, within the Church of God, some have fallen away. Now look what happened to the leadership, so-called leadership of the old worldwide Church of God. Look what they did. You know, and the Lord's going to judge them. I'm not judging them. No one else is judging them, or shouldn't be. But you know what they knew and what they threw away, maybe, uh, is is their problem. You know, come the judgment day, everyone's going to be standing in their own shoes. But what a terrible tragedy, tragedy, to to throw it away knowingly throw it all away but when you know the truth it gets easier you just have to start in the right direction it will it will grow with you and the proof is everywhere beginning today then today's sermon number 639 overall sermon 208 in our ongoing complete reading of the holy bible the king james translation we will be able to read through all of joel today there's only three chapters Keeping in mind there were no chapters in the original scriptures or verse numbers. Uh, actually, even they were about two centuries apart as they were added by European printers primarily. Uh, not that they're a bad thing. They certainly help. Um, can be a good thing. They can help us find things more quickly. But is that always a good thing? Is, have, are they sort of like a crutch? You, know, you think people have asked that. Did the people in the olden days, you know, Assuming they had Bibles, that's another matter because the reason is sort of a workaround reason because when everybody had Bibles, then they needed to be able to find things. But back in the time when people did have them with their scrolls, you know, they could find things. There was no chapter. Let's go to, you know, Isaiah chapter 14, verse whatever, because it wasn't there. They would have the scroll of Isaiah and they would open it to the part, to the place uh, that they may have had tagged in some way. They may have been doing that little Mark, bookmarks or something, scroll marks, little tags or something. I w would be surprised if they didn't use those. But the thing is, they, they didn't have the easiness that we have. And the irony of that is it seems like the more people that have the Bible, the more people that have the wrong idea about it. I mean, you look at all the man-made churches, all the things, all the nonsense, all the things that people have believed, which really what they're doing is believing in themselves. My church, my my Jesus. You know, it was only last year or so that I really come to realize what people are saying there. It isn't a matter of of being and looking up to the supreme Lord who was sent to do, to do all the work of creation. They, they're really talking about my Jesus and my church, me, me, me. And you know, that's that's going to stop. All the nonsense is going to stop because eventually everyone is going to realize that is literally a dead end. A lot of people just are bound, and it's a lot of religion. It's not just Christianity. Uh, a lot of people of Judaism have the same understanding that something is wrong, and they're right. But no, they're no more wrong than the Christian world, who's who's gone their own way for the same reason. You know, the Church of Rome is exactly that. The Church of Judaism, or the or the the religion of the of the Kingdom of Judah, is exactly that. And it isn't exclusive to a people or a nation which were created, number one, as the families of man, but oftentimes as a prophecy of what's more to come. Israel was created as a prophecy of the coming kingdom of God. They were created from all nations around them, just as the kingdom of God is going to be native-born spirit by then. That's how you enter. That's what John 3.16 is really about. From all nations, it doesn't matter who they were physically. And, you know, this idea that you have to be a Jew. If you, There's nothing wrong with being a Jew if you're a Jew. But if you're not, you're not. You don't have to be. Because they're part of the prophecy. And it, as a matter of fact, the reason, as we read here, Joel was a prophet to the southern kingdom. 
The reason the Lord really brought the hammer down on them over and over and over again, well, more or less left the rest of the nations alone, unless they were attacking Israel and Judah, during the time that Israel and Judah were worth defending, keeping in mind that the Lord used the Babylonians to bring down Judah and the Assyrians to bring down the northern kingdom of Israel. You know, it can go the other way. He didn't just let it happen. He made it happen. But, you know, you have to understand that what they were was a prophecy of the coming kingdom of God, and they didn't live up to it. They didn't live up to the prophecy because they turned it into something of themselves. And that's the mistake that Christianity makes. It's the mistake that I think all religions make. By their very nature, they're not looking at something. Uh, the, the Muslim religion, there was Muhammad. He went, you know, he, he, the things that he got right, he got right from the Bible. Idolatry and everything. He was a Bible reader. You know, he didn't live in the ancient times of Moses or something. He lived about six centuries after Christ. And he declared himself a great prophet. There was no Islamic religion or Muslim religion at the time of Muhammad. He went to the Christians and to the Jews and declared himself a, a prophet of Christianity and of Judaism. And when they rejected him, well, there he was. He had to do something, so he went off and created his own religion, declared himself a prophet. And there we are. But what, what was that about? Well, it's about a man, man-centered religion. And the nations then that they're, thereafter, you know, they don't look at the, the Arab borders. A lot of people equate Arabs with Muslims, but that's not correct either. Abraham was what would be called today an Arab. Many of his children, through his other wives and concubines, are the, they literally have a right to claim him as their father, just as much as the people of Israel did. He had a lot of children. Beside Isaac, besides Isaac, but it it isn't a matter. Of, it's all about me. It's all about our our nation here within our borders and and to blazes with the rest of humanity. It isn't like that because first of all, the rest of humanity is your own people. You know, people came from where they come from, and that's that's something that's lost on people kind of quick too. It's certainly lost on on Israel and Judah. You know, they view the Canaanites with such contempt, but the fact is the people of Judah were created, were born of two Canaanite mothers. Judah couldn't marry a Jew because there weren't any. Couldn't marry an Israelite because there was only one at that time, that was his sister Dinah, Ina, full sister, both children of Leah they were. So he married two Canaanite women, or at least had children by them. And the direct, as it stated, that through them, of the genealogy of Christ, you know, it's there, you want to read it, through those Canaanite women, Messiah's own genealogy. He didn't have a problem with it, because he understood that it's about humanity that were created. Not, not merely making the prophecy of what they were doing, the holy days, same thing, they made an endless end in themselves of the holy days, as a matter of their religion, but the thing is, they were prophetic of the coming kingdom of God, and of the Messiah. You know, Passover is the easy one, isn't it? You, know, you can look at Pente Passover, Pentecost too. I get ahead of myself there a little bit. But Passover is the obvious one, but all the other holy days, same thing. They're prophetic of the Messiah. The Day of Atonement is viewed as a great Jewish observance, but the thing is it's about Christ's deliverance of his Passover blood to the throne of God in heaven. What's the link on to that The Feast of Tabernacles, what the Jews call Sukkot. Or feast of booths, they built little booths all over which they are following the commandment, but again, they don't look at the reason for it. That is the return of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God, the temporariness of our physical bodies that are going to be put away and replaced with something that is permanent and forever. Joel chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Bethuel, Hear this, ye old men, and give here all ye inhabitants of the land Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Now think of this. If that were said to someone today, your father and your grandfather, well, someone today, that would mean someone, their fathers and grandfathers, well, they'd be born in the 1990s, and their grandfathers would be born in the 60s. Or if they said that a generation or two before that, think of the different world view of people. You have to get into their heads to understand the reason why the Lord was saying it. 
Verse 3, tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation, that which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation is come upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the check teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste, and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth, for the husband of her youth, the meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. The field is wasted, the land mourneth, for the corn is wasted, the new wines dried up, the oil languisheth. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen, howl, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. Now, to interject, that is talking about the fall of Judah for two reasons. Number, number one, as in the case of the northern kingdom, they simply became irresponsible. But number two, the Lord's blessings were being withdrawn. How does that happen? How does the Lord withdraw his blessings? Well, people do it to themselves when they stop obeying his law. Very simply, you'll be blessed with good health if you obey the Lord's laws of good health. It doesn't mean you'll never get sick because we're created as mortal creatures. The fix is in for that. We sooner or later, for whatever reason, sooner or later, die because that is a necessary part of putting away the old shell, the old body, in order to get one that doesn't die. But what they were doing was revoking the blessings that the Lord had gave to them through his law. The freedom, the peace, all the things that they knew of. And as a, as a prophecy of the future coming of the kingdom of God, a very small nation surrounded by enemies, they were protected for that reason. They weren't a big militaristic army nation, militaristic on the march all the time or turning it into a big industry. Whatever name that the Romans did the same thing. It's not what it was about. And they learned that. Israel learned it. Judah learned it. And learning it over and over again, actually. Israel right now, I'm sure most of them, most of them, Israelis are saying, thank God for nuclear weapons. Because if not, I think they would be living in fear knowing that the nations of the world, sooner or later, everybody turns the back on them. Hopefully no, not all at the same time, but you see it happen. And that's changed now. The reason that Israel will never be invaded. The beast power, you know, when he comes in, that's going to be, is viewed as, a, as an invasion, but no one can do that. You know, the Israeli general, a very famous quote, if they, ever, if they ever saw Israel, or Judah is really what it is, losing a war, will pull down the, the pillars of Samson. Meaning, you know, what Samson did when he died, his last act was to, with great strength, pull down those that building, and all the people came crashing down and were killed. That's what he was talking about. But the beast power, he's going to be let in because he's going to be welcomed. I, I think there's no doubt whatsoever that the European Union is going to have Israel as member, associate member, or whatever you want to call it, by virtue of politics, there's always a good name for things, but it's obvious, there's no other way he could do that, and the Church of Rome, they've already made those agreements uh, with the Vatican, it's the reason they can carry um, their statues through the streets of Jerusalem uh, at Easter and all that, it's the day all the Orthodox Jews stay home simply because they can't stand seeing it. To them it's the abomination as well. Verse 12, the vine is dried up and the 
fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests, howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God. For the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. You'll notice how that says it, the house of your God. Verse 14, Sanctify ye fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord, Alas for that day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. And to without getting ahead of ourselves, that's a dual prophecy. One was actually happening, as they were having experienced here for themselves. But it's returning, we're talking about the future day of the Lord. I'll put the link on for those studies what the Bible actually says about that. It's very, very plain, very simple. It is a prophecy of the yet future. It, this isn't the Old Testament way back there, uh, dead, gone, and otherwise, you know, over there, those people way over there. But it's a yet future event that's going to affect everybody because when the religious frenzy starts, there's going to be no escaping it. Suddenly people, you, do you have any relatives like that? If you happen to be um, a Sabbath keeper or observer of the true holy days, most Christian people really don't care. But come a great Sunday event or some Christmas wreath, you notice how religious they get all of a sudden? And if, you, if they see you as being different, it's like a threat to them. Even though you're not threatening them in any way, they just become all very unstable about it, as though what you do isn't as much a right for you to do as their right to do what they're doing. They feel all threatened. I mean, I don't feel threatened by people who keep Sunday or Christmas or Easter because I know that eventually they're going to come out of it. And we don't need to force anybody. We don't need to, to kill people or throw them in jail or, or waterboard them. Which, by the way, by the way, a lot of people think that began just in the present age. Waterboarding began during the Spanish Inquisition. Many people know of, of Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain as the employers of Christopher Columbus, but they were also the creators of the Spanish Inquisition, primarily. And a lot of the tortures that were there were intended to get people to convert. And waterboarding was one of them. They were mocking baptism by immersion as according to the biblical command and instruction. And it was a combination of sprinkling, you know, pouring water on the face over. And it's exactly, there There are actually illustrations of it, of it. It's exactly what the CIA was doing, or is still doing. They say they're not. So I guess they, if they say they're not, they're not, right? But it's exactly the same thing. And people deny that it's torture. Do you know there were actually the Japanese war crimes trials at the end of the Second World War? Japanese officers, some of them were executed for war crimes that included specifically waterboarding. It was a war crime then. But it began long before the 20th century war crimes thing. It began as a religious matter. It was a mockery of, of true baptism, getting people to repent of the truth and observing their, their idea of what their church was doing, and still is. History, the roots of it run deep. A lot of people, you know, the old Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. It's true. And oftentimes, so many people miss the understanding of things of the present by not looking at history. Because if you go, sometimes you don't have to go very far back. Sometimes you have to go quite a ways back. But you'll always find the origin of something and the reason for it. And you will, might be shocked, and, or at least very surprised, to, to see that there really is no difference in how it is used, the purpose of it, the spirit of it. And that may in itself be a clue. Verse 16, Is not the meat cut off before our eyes? Yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seed is rotten under their clods. The garners are laid desolate. The barns are broken down, for the corn is withered. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed.
because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. O Lord, to thee will I cry, for the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of waters are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. And again, how things happen when an attitude, a responsibility changes. And again, the blessings are really in your own hands. If you want to be blessed by the Lord, just obey Him. That's all. It's very simple. Joel chapter 2, and you will notice, please, that some of this could never happen in the past. It's referring directly to the return of Jesus Christ. To a world that is not going to accept him peaceably, so he's not going to res respond peaceably. He's going to respond in the manner uh, that humanity has accustomed itself, for the most part. And so we get this. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. And I, ha as I'm reading this, uh, this particular King James Version has reference quotes in each verse, and just put that single verse, verse 2 there, it has references to Amos 5.18, Sephaniah 1.15, Exodus 10.14. I won't go back and do those because we want to get this done today, but you see how it's all connected? It didn't somehow begin uh, at the Exodus or begin at Matthew 1.1 1, 1, or begin whenever. It, it began at the beginning. The Father sent the Lord God to do the work of creation. Uh, according to Arius, the Lord God was himself created. Uh, calling him the son is a pretty good, you know, you didn't call him brother or, or uncle or anything. You called him son. Uh, and the reason for that, such as it's been, and how he is obedient to the Father uh, and the commandments in themselves. But continuing. A fire devoureth before them and behind them a flame burneth. The land is parched. The land is as the Garden of Eden, Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. And of course, there have been um, ways of that happened to a very limited degree. Ironically, what was Eden today, Iraq? I mean, look what happened there. In the invasion, how it was left behind, just really a rubble. And now it's just slowly, slowly, slowly slipping back to what it was before. Uh, eventually, another dictator will rise there. And if he's a smart one, like old Saddam was, uh, he'll get himself uh, with a whole lot of friendlies uh, in the Western world. Keeping in mind, you know, Saddam Hussein used to be an ally of the West, primarily because of his wars against Iran at the time. Uh, but then he became a little too independent, and so he had to go. And, you know, but he was, you know, he could, and as far as the crimes and war crimes they committed, there was no difference. As a matter of suddenly, he didn't become a bad dictator by committing war crimes. He was committing them before, but he was pro-Western. He was hardly, you know, democratic, you know, situation such as it was. And Iran, of course, the way it is viewed in uh, the Western world, uh, very brutal and public hangings and so on. By the way, if you really want to, if you're a doctor, you probably know this, but a lot of researchers have done it. You see these horrendous public hangings uh, in Iran where they put it, they're not the drop hangings uh, as is done in the western world, but the suspension hanging. People are are either just something is kicked out from underneath them, a table or sometimes they're on top of a, a truck or something, or a crane even lifts them up in the air. But you know, as far as, don't get me wrong when I say this, but as far as being the most humane manner of execution, that's really it. It's not bloody. It's not painful. They, they don't have the, the drop. That may be sudden, but it, it's very messy. Can be, can be. Whereas the suspension hanging, they go unconscious from the cut off the blood flow within 10 or 15 seconds. For them, from their conscious perspective, it's over. 
and they actually strangle when they're unconscious. And, you know, it's ironic that one of the worst dictatorships in the world, as it's viewed, has one of the most humane uh, methods of execution. And even, you know, the the uh, electrocution, well, you know, you know what happens there, sometimes those get botched. And even the uh, lethal injection, that you know, that can go on for quite a while, and that can get botched, and they're having problems with the chemicals, the shooting them, the firing squad, and everything. But, you, you know, why the Western democracies, uh, where the, those that have executions don't look into suspension hanging as a humane, it's the most humane thing there is. Bizarre, as that may seem. But it's true. They don't strangle. They, they go unconscious within 10 or 15 seconds to cut off the blood flow. It's still alive, but it's like it, it has its own um, putting out and then the execution. Sometimes I get diverted. There it is. Verse 4, the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and as horsemen, so shall they run, like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains, shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. And of course, many people easily recognize that as war helicopters. I'll put the link on for those studies. Very plainly, uh, how that's going to happen, the wars of man, not, not the meaning uh, that somehow humans are going to become more warlike. That's hard to imagine. But they're going to be have less restraint within themselves. And as the law of God, is again, is abandoned, uh, the respect for borders uh, goes to zero, practically. Uh, and keeping in mind the borders that were created primarily by the Lord, a link, link on for the boundary law, uh, the reason for that, all the different families of man, it wasn't just to protect Israel, it was to protect Israel's neighbors from Israel. It was like a line. Again, you know, they lived in peace and they benefited, you know, from Israel. It's only when they attacked Israel that the Lord's wrath came upon them. And, you know, as far as, and again, as we mentioned, uh, the Canaanite people don't forget that the first Jews, which are the direct line, the beginning of the line of King David and the Messiah, uh, from two Canaanite women. Put the link on for that. That shocks a lot of people, and I can hear the click, click, click going off, but. You know, you can run and hide from the truth, or you can handle it. But sooner or later, you know, the running isn't going to work anymore. The truth is coming, and there you're going to be. There's going to be nowhere, no direction to run where the truth isn't there looking you in the face. Verse 6, Before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks, neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. An interesting idea there, some think upon that is some sort of uh, bullet resistant armor, you know, an arm ring, and how the, they can fly together in formation like that. Modern day electronics will do that for you. Verse 9, they shall run to and fro in the city, they shall run upon the wall, they shall climb up upon the houses, they shall enter in at the windows like a thief. Uh, again, if you've ever seen some of the accuracy of missiles, now they can fly one right in a window uh, to kill uh, terrorists, so-called. Never mind that the building is full of other people. But Verse 10, the earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. That doesn't mean that there is going to be a blackout of the sun and moon. That simply means that the atmosphere is going to be so full of smoke and fire and so on. They showed the videos of the Fort McMurray fire uh, a few days ago and how the people escaping, one man at a dash camp going, and it was like pitch black midnight, escaping through the smoke and everything. And suddenly he got to the edge of it, and it was a bright sunny day. You know what goes on above uh, the smoke and the clouds is a bright. It's every day is a bright sunny day above the clouds. There's no such thing as a cloudy day in heaven. In that heaven, it's only in the lower heaven, which is heaven too. The, very plainly, the three levels of heaven: the birds fly in heaven, snow come and rain come down from heaven. All that's expressed. But this is talking plainly about smoke. And fire, and by that time, volcanoes, and, and all the things that are set ready to go. 
as part of the cleaning up or cleaning away uh, of Satan's world, all the things, it's going to have to be destroyed anyway. It's going to save a lot of people a lot of work. Verse 11, And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong and executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? And keeping in mind, we are reading there of physical war, of how, how humans will be making war against each other, and against him they shall make war with the Lamb, as plainly stated in the book of Revelation, but they're going to come up against a real superpower miraculous superpower of the Lord as an army as well as we're reading in the book of Revelation as we will read when we get there how we, his return will be at the head of a great angelic army verse 12 therefore also now saith the Lord turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. So no matter how bad somebody is, if they repent, they'll be forgiven. Because in most cases, the badness is merely a reflection or manifestation of the evil attitude, the spirit of Satan that has caused humans to behave as they do. The original human nature was sinless and pure, and peaceful. Verse 14, Who knoweth if he will return and repent and have a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests and ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen would rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you approach among the heathen. Now keep in mind that when the Messiah returns, on that day will be the first resurrection to spirit. But humanity, physical humanity, will continue, because they will then have their calling, their opportunity, through the thousand years, generation after generation, apparently, because that's the way why else have it go on for a thousand years? And then the great resurrection of all the uncalled from all the ages. Billions of people, they too, same thing. But um, notice among them, you know, there's still the freedom. There will still be the heathens, unbelievers, because no one is forced to become someone who accepts the Lord's offer of salvation. They can reject it if they want to. So even then, there will be heathens. As we read those who don't observe the Feast of Tabernacles in the kingdom of God, well, they don't have to, but they're not going to have rain, they're going to have plagues, they're going to have problems. And again, the reason for that is to help them to come along to the truth. And again, how they reject the blessings of the Lord by failing, refusing to obey Him. Verse 20, But I will remove far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea, and his hinder part toward the utmost sea, and his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things. And the great things there that it's referring to, obviously, are great things of evil. Verse 21, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. And that's the other kind of great thing. I'll put the link on for truly uplifting. Verse 22, Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, the latter rain, in the first month, 
and the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore you to the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in the plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And my people there is simply referring to everybody who chooses to love and obey him. Period. Not merely those who are given to be a prophetic symbol, an object lesson, a stage play, if you will, of the coming kingdom of God. And then they didn't do very well. Verse 27, And ye shall know that I am the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and then else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And again, the identity, once they realize, that they, they may recite the Ten Commandments, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, but they're going to realize then who the Lord God was, because, you know, the people in, in the time of the Messiah when he came, you know, they know him, knew him, saw him face to face, talked with him, argued with him, rejected him, killed him, spit him on him, beat him, did all sorts of things, but as a lamb of God. And even then, the lambs, you know, the sacrificed lambs, he was sacrificed at the same time the lambs were, but they didn't abuse the lambs that were being sacrificed. It was a humane killing, quick, clean, and over with. It was nothing like what they did to the Lamb of God. But again, the purpose for that, the healing by his stripes, where he healed all the beatings and things that humans have done to one another, he took it all. Literally, he took it all. Verse 28, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. Now again, where is that quoted? Well, the so-called birthday of the church in the book of Acts, because it's dual. It would happen to them at that time, the so-called birthday of the church, even though there were many of the church that existed long before that, by virtue of the Holy Spirit. But again, it's, it's looking to beyond that, to that yet future time in physical humanity, Everyone else will do the same with those as those who did it before them. And those who did it before them will be helping them, serving them, teaching them, guiding them, doing the things that they did before. Verse 29, And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days I will pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. And now that doesn't just mean claiming my Jesus or using Jesus' name or Christ's title uh, for a particular church and then doing whatever they please by that. Because we're also warned you know, many will come to you in that day and say, well, haven't we done great things in your name, built great churches in you know, your name, and done wonderful works in your name? He's going to say to them, I never knew you. Because, you know, just hijacking his name and doing great things for yourself is not Christianity. That's self-anity. Self-anity. You know, so that sort of, sort of rhymes with vanity. Self-anity. Is that a word? Probably not a word, but we, we make words here once in a while. Sometimes new words are necessary. Joel 3, and you will notice, as I mentioned before, the length of a book really doesn't mean anything necessarily, because first of all, the word of God is major. I'm referring to major prophets and minor prophets, so-called when really they are not. And the references to all of the things that are here, I'll just go through this quickly here. In this particular chapter, as I said, this, this King James Bible has references, scriptures to other scriptures. And just in chapter 3, it has references to Ezekiel 38.14, Job 5.19, Isaiah 43.5 and 6, Jeremiah 23.8, Ezekiel 38.7, Micah or Micah 4.3, Psalm 7 6 and Psalm 98 9, Revelation 14 15, Jeremiah 51 33, Isaiah 63 3, Numbers 2 1, Isaiah 13 10, 
Isaiah 11, 9, Amos 9, 13, Jeremiah 49, 17, Obadiah 10, and Isaiah 4, 4. And that's just in the third chapter of Joel, the, the cross-references to other scriptures. So you think it isn't all connected. And again, how the Word of God is, you know, and some of these are major prophecies. The, the fact is that what they were given was to speak a particular message. And again, Joel is regarded as a minor prophet, but much of what he has written about the day of the Lord, the ultimate day of the Lord, hasn't happened yet. And the whole world is going to know about that. Maybe not many people have read his book, but they're going to feel it and understand it one way or another, because even those who have died throughout history are going to experience the parts that we read here of how the resurrections, and then they will know and and then they could still be heathens if they want to, but then they will have no excuse. You see the connections? It's all there. The Bible is like no other book. You simply, there is no way that anyone could, could cook up the Bible, a book like the Bible, and make it happen. There's wonderful philosophy and wonderful science fiction, but that's exactly what science fiction is. It's fiction. This is reality, truth, reality, and it's happening. All of it. Joel 3, 4, Behold, in those days, and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people, for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Now the irony of that is the end time captivity that they have there will be the result of entanglements that they have made with that beast power, because otherwise there's no way he would have come in, been able to, as we said. Israel is a modern-day nuclear-armed nation. They could stop anybody from doing that who they didn't want to come in. But their captivity is going to be the result of that entanglement. They simply politically will not be able to fire upon their own president, federal president. And so much of what the world today seems to be going either nationalism as an isolationism or globalism. It's one or the other. And the, what the beast will be, in a way, will be like a combination of the two. It will be very... I've compared it to like a cancer. The main tumor is impregnable. It does not permit any sort of invasion of itself, while at the same time it invades distant places. And that's the philosophy of a lot of of empires, really, but this particular one, it's going to go beyond that because it's going to be strength, strong within itself, and yet through the its influence, its psychological influence, like when someone, all the nations of the world say, who can make war with them? As though it's just futile to even try. If you can really lay that kind of a, of a, a job on people's minds where they think that, where they don't even dare to fight you, even though you're there invading their countries, then you won. You know, it, it's the reality of how the unreality will take hold, and there it will be. And again, the deception at that time. The great false prophet, how is even people of other religions are going to look at the miracles and be mesmerized by it, even though they may not accept. And at that time, there is no doubt whatsoever that there will be some reasoning, some misapplied logic, some warp logic, that will make it seem also right for them. All of them. Verse 3, And they have cast lots for my people, and have given a boy for an harlot, and sold a girl for wine, that they might drink. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, all the coast of Palestine? Will ye render me a recompense? And if ye recompense me swiftly and speedily, I will return your recompense upon your own head. And that's very plainly stated what what that is, where that is, the heart of it, that so-called Palestine, which actually in the Bible, it, it, it's amazing again how they used this particular modern-day definition of Palestine, when in fact, biblically, Palestine lim was limited to the land of the Philistines, that known today as Gaza. That was it. You know, Palestine is merely another English-language pronunciation of Philistine. It means the same thing. Goliath was a Palestinian or a Philistine of that land. That was their territory. Judah never took it. 
it was sovereign even to that time. When David was on in flight from Saul, he took refuge for a time in Palestine or Gaza in the Philistine territory. And Saul never went after him because they were mighty warriors. I put the link on for that. Where's Palestine? The understanding of that in the modern day sense is an important understanding of how or why, more, more particularly why the reasoning of the view, particularly of, it, of a world view of it, and how even then it's addressing something, a misapplied geographic definition that only came into existence in its present sense in the last hundred years. And again, that's, that's speaking of something that, and again, the Bible, just, no one could have ever cooked that up and made it happen like that. Verse 5, because ye have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things, the children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians that ye might remove them far from the border. Keep in mind, when this was written, the Greek Empire was yet a far distant situation. This wasn't yet in the time of the Babylonians. The Babylonians fell to the to the Persians, and then the Persians fell to the Greeks. The Greek Empire, it, the Greeks existed, they're, they're one of the most ancient nations on earth, but as far as being able to have that military or political power, they didn't have it. It didn't exist yet. But it's spoken of here matter-of-factly, because again, the Lord does that, because physical time to him doesn't exist. He's not bound. It's like, as it's said, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. Verse 7, Behold, I will raise them out of the place, whither ye have sold them, and return your recompense upon your own head. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off, for the Lord hath spoken it. Dual statement there, that happened in ancient times. The, we'll put the link on for that as well, the Sabaeans how that connection is to the present-day nations of the world such as it is, and how the viewpoint of it is is multi-level as, as a matter of time. It's just amazing. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war, make up, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say I am strong. And again, that is a direct reversal of the very famous swords into plowshares. But the reason for it is to get that entire sense, that attitude, out in the open where it can be destroyed. And again, that's speaking of the end time. Another reason why all the war is going to increase is because people who have there will be no fence sitters at that time. You will either be for us or against us, in effect, and from the Lord's point of view there. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about thither, because thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge the heathen round about. Again, that's the great battle. I'll put the link on for that, valley of Jehoshaphat. In the duality of that, the major one being yet in the future. Verse 13, put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, and the vats overflow, for the wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Again, as I said, I'll put the links on for the day of the Lord. Two studies for that. Verse 15, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. And again, the duality is the fulfillment by that time, by that time, the fulfillment of what Israel is about, and even Judah, although Judah became a separate part of it primarily because of the Messiah. They would never have got as far as they'd have without that Messianic connection. And their claim to Jerusalem, which was as much actually of the Benjamites, the reason they stood together, both of those tribal territories bordered uh, on Jerusalem, Benjamin to the north, Judah to the south. 
Verse 17, So ye know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her any more. And that isn't talking about the city he's made. You, know, you have to be a Jew to be in Jerusalem. It's talking about his people, period. Verse 18, And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with with waters and a fountain shall come forth out of the house, come forth of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness, for the violence against the children of Judah, and because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall dwell forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation, for I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. And of course, you can read that verse from its historical perspective, but you can read verse where all nations will look to Zion to the law. Um, put the link on for that. The law shall go forth from Zion. All nations. Everyone at that time is going to become one nation. It's the ultimate globalism because that's what the kingdom of God is going to be about. Kingdom of God on earth. Period. There won't be all these other nations running around claiming whatever they, they're part of the God's creation uh, for themselves as though they own it, because they don't. The Lord created it for his purpose, and that is for for it to become the kingdom of God, the very headquarters, the very throne of God. Because as we read in Revelation, the Father is coming to earth when all is done. And again, the ultimate paradox, you know, you could say that to the astronomers and they, they won't, they'll sort of laugh at you, but there's going to come a time when they're going to realize it. Paradoxically, if there was no God, there should be a universe teeming with life. Because that would mean there was no God necessary for life to begin on Earth. And with all those other planets out there, it's, it's absolutely certain that there will be planets out there with, with life on them. Many even Earth-like, perhaps. But the thing is, that's not how it happened. It was created. The Earth was created. Life began here. And all those planets out there, they're not created in vain. The Lord doesn't do things in vain. But we're not ready yet. And the idea that somehow all those other creatures out there created in vain, I mean, what what good are they? If they don't know the Lord, what good are they even if they do exist? Because it doesn't matter whether you're on earth or out in the vastness of the universe, it's still all the Lord's. It still all belongs to the Lord, not to other people. Whatever form they may take. Thank you for joining us for services this week. As always, your being with us makes our joy complete. Until next week, when we meet again on this, God's holy Sabbath day, may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless you all.